Well, good morning. <laughs> it's uh, been a challenging morning, as you can imagine. We were supposed to be live streaming this service, but uh, we discovered in the last minute that the camera we were using has to go through the camera's gateway, and we couldn't get it to start, and so I went out to the gateway to check, and there was a big sign up there saying, uh, under maintenance, uh, gateway not working. So the camera, of course, couldn't get to YouTube, and we had to you know, scramble and figure out another way of doing this. So uh, good morning, welcome. Um, I'm Reverend Millage Butch, Butch Mosby, and this and I'm is- I'm Pam Mosby, pastoral assistant. Yes. So, um, you know, we're sorry about that, but we will, uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, and just to remember, you know, um, to uh, continue to support us financially, we appreciate that. There are three ways you can do it, either through PayPal or through just a mail, a, um, a check to the office. And also through a, an app called Tithely, T-I-T-H-E dot L-Y. So let's get started. And Pamela, um, oh, no, we can't do that right okay. now because that didn't work. Right. <laughs> right. So, all right, so please um, start us off with the Daily Word. Good morning. This is the Daily Word for Palm Sunday, April the 5th. And the key word is Hosanna. The affirmation is with joy, love, and faith. I celebrate my growing Christ awareness. According to the gospel stories, shouts of Hosanna arise as the people cover the dusty road with palm branches, greeting Jesus with great enthusiasm as he rides a donkey into Jerusalem. Spiritually understood, the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem symbolizes the dawning of Christ awareness in the heart of humankind. The crowd shout of Hosanna represent prayers that this dawning Christ awareness be protected and nurtured. I reflect on this powerful story, seeing in myself both the dawning Christ awareness and the shouting crowd of thoughts responding to the Christ light. On this Palm Sunday, my heart sings Hosanna. I celebrate the growing Christ awareness in the Jerusalem of my soul. And the scripture is Mark 11:10. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Thank you, Pamela. So, uh, after we after the talk, uh, after I do this talk, we're going to have a special um, Palm Sunday uh, meditation by Pamela. So please stay with us through that process. So. Today, you know, of course, is, is, Lent, is our Palm Sunday, and we're continuing this journey called Spiritual Preparation for Easter, and today's in the, in the um, Fasting and Feasting uh, um, Lent booklet, there is, uh, the heading of it is, Christ is the one we might become, and so we're going to talk about that today and sort of wrap it into this whole dynamic of what we're going through right now with this coronavirus and all of us being locked in our homes. And, you know, it's just mind blowing how you don't realize how many people are locked in the house. I was trying to make an order the other day and it didn't go through. So I called the, the, the store and <laughs> what I got, I got an answer and the guy came back and he helped me out. And then he says, you got to give me a moment because it's hard to do this from home. And I, you know, I'm, it's just thinking that you're dealing with a store and you forget that all these people are working from home. So it's a whole new dynamic that we're in, and it does create a lot of anxiety for folks. But we're going to talk about some of the spiritual dynamics that we can use, spiritual tools we can use to help us to get through this period. So in, like I said, in today's reading in the Lent booklet, it's by James Dillard Freeman, and expresses this idea, Christ is the one we all might become. And he says, there was one who showed us what we all might become. He did not tell us what our lives should be like. He, rather, he lived the life that we might live. So as we often say, Jesus is our way shower. He is uh, what we call the prototype spiritual person. If you were to have a conversation with God and say, God, what should I be like? God would say, be like Jesus. Now, in other cultures, you know, it might be um, one of the great gurus or mystics that that culture might say be like, let me be like Buddha or so forth. But for us as Christians, we say be like Jesus. And it's inter interesting, you know, today is Palm Sunday, and as practical 
metaphysical Christians. It represents an important day in our own journey to making the shift from ego to spirit and from fear to faith. Now, let me just say it. Practical metaphysical Christians. And what that means is we practice the teachings of Jesus from a metaphysical perspective. We try to understand what is the true reason behind what is what I'm experiencing, or really right now we can say what is the true metaphysical reason behind this whole that idea of COVID-19 and, and uh, the coronavirus. I mean, what, what are the real, what is really happening under what appears to be happening? So that's what, why we call ourselves practical metaphysical Christians, because we're always trying to look at what is the truth behind even the struggle that we may be going through. So, you know, and what, what, what's occurring in the world today, this shift from fear to, uh, to faith is critical for remaining Christ-centered no matter what is occurring in the world. So the whole idea of being a, a practicing metaphysician, so to speak, is that no matter what's happening out here, you don't let that really change the dynamics of what's happening in here. And as we, you know, we study this, you know, we study this idea historically that Jesus took this ride into Jerusalem. It's that, you know, today it symbolizes him making his triumphant ride into Jerusalem. And we look at it historically, but we want to try to understand what does that mean metaphysically. So Jerusalem is a place in our consciousness where we find peace and a sense of well-being in mind, body, and spirit, no matter what is happening in our world. Uh, Jerusalem represents our spiritual consciousness, a place in which we find refuge from outer circumstances that might cause us to be fearful rather than faithful. So today also represents our own triumphant ride into Jerusalem, into that place of peace within us. And that's what we're going to look at in this lesson is how do we get to that place of peace when there's so much change that's going on? People are starting to call this the new normal. Um, so there's a lot of change going on, and how do we remain peaceful in this change? So the Lenten journey is leading us to Calvary and the experience on the cross. And what we have learned from studying Jesus' journey to Calvary is that it seems that the real struggle became apparent when he entered into the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay? Now, the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary explains that Gethsemane symbolizes the struggle that takes place within our consciousness when we realize that truth is the one true reality, regard, a true reality that aids us in untranscending the fear of everyday thinking, um, and it keeps us grounded in spirit no matter what is happening in our world. So let me say that again. So Gethsemane symbolizes the struggle that takes place within our consciousness when we realize that truth is the one true reality regardless of what's happening in the world. So the question is, what is truth? Well, we're expressing truth as being Christ's mind, which is our one true mind that aids us in transcending fear of the everyday thinking that is grounded in what's happening in the world. So, you know, there's a mind, there is a mind within us that's greater than our mind. And we have all experienced it. We've heard that still small voice giving us uh, a different guidance from what a fearful thinking in our mind might be giving us. So that's sort of the mind that we want to um, uh, build up within ourselves, become more connected to. So being in Gethsemane represents a struggle we go through when we begin to realize that the fearful thoughts of our typical mind are completely out of sync with the faith-filled thoughts of our Christ or spiritual mind. So we're in this place where we sort of know this, the ideas that will keep us spiritually centered, but we're also struggling with what is happening in the world. So Gethsemane is where our personal self is in conflict with our spiritual self. Sort of another way of explaining the dark night of the soul. And again, that's a whole other talk in itself, this idea of dark night of the soul. But I think just from the description of what it sounds like, you, we have all probably had a dark night of the soul moment. All right? And what's, what's happening in the world right now, we might continuously be trying to pull ourselves out of being pulled into a dark soul, uh, night of the soul moment. So the Garden of Gethsemane represents for each one of us the place where a tremendous shift in consciousness occurs from the thinking based on fear around what is occurring in our lives to the thinking based on faith, love, and wisdom that comes from knowing that the truth of our being remains true regardless, again, of what is happening in the world. So this shift from fear to faith 
occurs from diligently doing the work necessary to establish a divine connection to the truth of our being. And that's the purpose of Lent. How do I establish a divine connection to the truth of my being? All right. So how do we prepare ourselves to enter into the Garden of Gethsemane transformative experience? In other words, we are going to have that experience. Uh, there are going to be times when we feel very up and very positive and very faith-filled, and there are going to be times where we're feeling different from that. You know, so how do we negotiate that process? It requires a shift in our mental-emotional diet, basically, which begins with fasting from all thinking that's not grounded in faith, peace, jo uh, love, and joy. And this includes fasting from allowing ourselves to be continuously bombarded by what's occurring in the world. I know uh, you turn on the TV now and all the news is about the coronavirus. It's interesting that there's no news almost about anything else besides the coronavirus and the economy. Those two things that are the driving force, right? So, you know, this, this includes fasting from being continuously bombarded by that kind of news. Now, this doesn't mean to stop being informed. You know, we want to be informed. There's also what came to me in a walk. Pam and I do a, a six-mile walk in the morning, and it came to me that, you know, Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And, you know, he, he might have been talking about taxes at the time or whatever. But give to Caesar what is Caesar's. In other words, be aware of what's happening in the world, but also give God what is God, which is remaining faith, having faith in God, regardless of what is happening in the world. All right. So this doesn't mean, to, like I said, to stop being a form. It has more to do with not letting yourself get so fearfully entangled that your faith in God becomes strangled. Let me say it again. It has more to do with not letting yourself get so fearfully entangled that your faith in God becomes strangled. And, you know, just like the purpose of a physical fast is to cleanse your body, Okay. When you're not eating, your body's going, no garbage coming in, so I got time to run around and clean up all the garbage and, you know, get the cells healthy and just make a healthier environment inside of us. And it, it sort of helps the body to resurrect. So we're sort of resurrecting our physical body when we're spending time in fasting. So the purpose of fasting from negative, fearful thinking is to create a, a peaceful environment in which we can resurrect a new state of consciousness filled with faith, love, uh, divine wisdom, di divine order, you know, compassionate understanding. So that's what I was saying about sometimes you want to fast from the input that is coming in for about what's happening in the world so that you can let your mind kind of relax back down into its spiritual self. And again, as we see in Scripture, Jesus did this quite a bit. He went away for a while. He went up into the mountain, and it talks a lot about him going away from a while to sort of re, you know, re, re, um, regroup himself and keep himself spiritually centered. So the Lenten journey prepares us for the crucifixion of our old fearful self with its tendency to be intrigued and addicted to uh, fear in its many components to make way for a resurrection of our new self, free from addiction to fear and inspired only by faith and love. And it's interesting, this idea of addiction to fear. It's like, you know, we, we, we t you know the news we know is 85% negative and 15% positive. We do seem to be getting a lot more positive in the news talking about all of the people who are putting themselves on the front line in order to help, you know, those in need. So you're seeing a lot more of that, which is, you know, actually a good thing. So this idea of, you know, you know uh, getting yourself into a position where you kind of lose your addiction to fear and be more connected to the faith dynamics that are within you. And the key is, this is the journey we've all been destined to take. This idea of moving from fear to faith is the journey we are all destined to take. That is why we're here. How do I be in the world but not of it? How do I be in the world but not have the, the spiritual dynamics of my being changed by what is happening in the world. And so this is, the, again, the, the journey we have all um, been destined to take, meaning that we need to do the study, the sacrifice, the ritual, you know, all the stuff we go through in our preparation for Easter is symbolic of the journey that we're here to take. It's our spiritual destiny to make the journey to Calvary, uh, the place within our consciousness where we cross out fear to clear the way to fully embrace faith. So that is sort of the 
metaphysical understanding of the cross. The idea of the cross, again, is to cross out fear, to make a clear path for you to be you know, fully wrapped in faith. So for the shift from fear to faith to occur, something substantial must take place within us, which is symbolic of why Jesus had the experience on the cross. You know, there's talk among mystics that Jesus really didn't have to do, go through the cross experience. Um, he could have just ascended. But the concept is he wanted to show the full dynamic of how do we diminish the, the personal self and expand within ourselves the spiritual self. So what occurred on the cross at Calvary was that Jesus' personal will was crucified, crossed out, overcome, so that the Christ, truth, could become the dominant force in the forefront of his mind as well as in the minds of every one of us. That's why, again, the title of if this was uh, what, from the thing is, you know, um, he is the one who, who we can become, all right? He demonstrated that to show us the way. And remember, again, that today's theme is Christ is the one who we are destined to become. As John the Baptist expressed in John 3.30, he must increase and I must decrease. He, the Christ, or, uh, you know, if you got rid of the pronoun, the Christ must increase. And sort of the, 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 the um, ego self, the personal self, must decrease. Not that you're going to get rid of it, but the, the, the dynamics change in terms of what is dominant and what is, you know, minor in, in the aspects of our being. So today's theme is, uh, again, a crisis of one we're destined to become. So after the crucifixion and resurrection experience, the idea of being destined to become, the personal self um, was moved out of the way so that this, this Christ self within Jesus could become more expressive. And so that's why he's, you know, his name changed. We, you know, we also think of, of Jesus from Nazareth, became Jesus Christ, and then after the resurrection, he became Christ Jesus. Even Jesus Christ was a personal expressing the Christ, but Christ Jesus is the Christ being an expression through the personal self. And for us, the crossing out experience occurs as we loosen our attachment to our persona, you know, the many masks that we choose to hide behind. You've heard me explain many times, and for those who may not have heard it, persona is a Greek word where per is mask and sauna is through which we make a sound. And, you know, the Swiss uh, psychiatrist Carl Jung explained that the persona is a compromise between the actual perception of ourself and the many selves we choose to express in our varied um, relationships. So, in other words, there's a self that we know, the true self. But a lot of times we don't express that true self. We get, we, depending on what in, uh, situation we're in, we will whip on a mask, a persona, to express what we think is necessary in that particular situation. And yes, it is true. In many situations, in many instances, it seems necessary to wear one of our many personas to negotiate our way through certain encounters. It's just the way that we are right now. Um, there are times when we just need to feel like we need to be somebody else in order to get through this situation. However, in the book Awakening the Buddhist Heart, the author explains that the persona becomes problematic and limiting when it becomes so fixed that it causes us to become frozen in place. Um, the persona becomes problematic when it doesn't allow for growth and authentic feelings, when it insulates us and acts like a shell or an armor around us. So if you're hiding behind your persona, then it keeps you, it, it stops you from really growing and becoming you know, a more open and expressive person of the truth you know, of your being. Charles Fillmore cut this idea of crystallized race consciousness. We become crystallized in a thought process, and it's hard for us to break free of that thought process. So the author explains further that a fixed persona is a stumbling block to our spiritual path, right? So if you're stuck in a certain way of thinking and being in a way that you see the world, you can't, you can't expand spiritually because you are stuck in this space that you're in. So it's sort of like, you know, the wilderness experience for Jesus and Moses, if you heard me say before, was 
Moses especially realized he no longer could be who he was, but he didn't yet fully understand where he was headed. And so he got caught up in that wilderness experience. And this shift that we're all going through will cause that for all of us. We'll be breaking free and letting go of how we were, but not yet fully understanding how we are, you know, what we're uh, potentially can become. So we haven't, you know, what we haven't been able to grasp yet is how our attachment to a role, a look, or an image can stand in the way of our inner search for divine connection to God. We become so outer directed that it actually prevents us to becoming inner directed. And so think about that. You know, advertising, marketing, everything is about how you show up in the world, all right? And so we do so many things to do that that we, I don't know how much time we spend really trying to understand the depths of our own being. And the author says what we need to understand is that the persona we create, the personas we create, are tightly wrapped up in the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are, what we are capable of, and what we are afraid of, okay? So in short, we often use our persona as a unquestionable reason to cling to the will of our ego. Our persona says, this is the way I am. This is what I have to cling to. This is who I, how I show up. Um, a really good movie around that is, is um, Pamela, what was the movie with, uh, it's uh, Madam, Wa- uh, Madam C.J. Walker. It was called Self something. But it's it. if you have not seen it Self-made. yet, it's Self Made. Mm-hmm. It's on um, Netflix. Now it's a person in 19, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, those times when women um, were, you know, held down. In this case, an, an African-American woman became the first female millionaire because she didn't let herself become, become held down by a persona that the that society was trying to put on her. So that's sort of a, a good movie, uh, movie series. They think there's five of them in that series to, to check out. But, you know, when we take off our armor and discard bits and pieces of our persona, so it's not like you change your persona all at one time, but you're getting to let go of bits and pieces of it, especially bits and pieces that you know have a tendency to create friction in your life with others or whatever. So when we begin to discard those bits and pieces, we also let go of our ego's need to cling to its perception. So as we let go of our persona, we also are letting go of our perceptions. And this helps us to loosen some of the fears that we so adamantly cling to. Okay? And just one more quote from the author of the book, Awakening the Buddha's Heart. Heart. When we release and drop our attachments to our person, persona-driven images, whether those images are represented by appearance, possession, status, role, or attitude, we become closer to our authentic self, our true inner Christ self. And so we have to actually think about that. And again, a lot of what we're talking about here, if you kind of, you know, kind of have questions about it, Monday night, 7 o'clock, um, join us for the uh, Ask the Minister Zoom session. And that's where we can have a, a deeper discussion of some of these ideas. So Jesus' life is a, is a lesson in humility and surrender. And that's what led to the true glory and power that he, he expressed. Jesus surrendered his persona, Jesus, to the Christ within himself. He overcame the dramatic perceptions of his personal self, and that is a great lesson he came to teach us. As the title represents, he is the one we all might become. Okay? And at present, most of us are mesmerized by the dramatic perceptions of our personal self. And you know, mesmerized by it is that we're, we're, it's hard for us to let it go because we are. We're just caught up in, this is how I am. Okay? And we're entrenched in what we believe to be our reality, captivated by our own perceptions of how we think things ought to be in order to feel that our world is okay. And as one um, multi-billionaire was talking about last night, he said, you know, this is a hidden enemy that we're dealing with, and we just were not prepared to deal with it. So our world is changing, and we have to figure out how to manage this new dynamic that is happening. But in the life, you know, teachings of Jesus, we find techniques we can practice to help unravel ourselves from the fears based on out of circumstances. But this unraveling is not easy. You hear me say that a lot. So there are techniques we can use, but the use, use of those techniques are not easy. So it's written in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary that 
the seat of our conscious mind is in the front of our brain, right up here. And there, you know, there our will, our ego has established its, its domain. And it's interesting that we talk about that. So it's this conscious mind, in the marketing textbook I use at college, it talks about the gatekeeper. And the gatekeeper is just right here. And information can't get in past that gatekeeper, all right? So it is through this gatekeeper in the front of our brain that everything affecting our body and our lives is admitted or rejected, okay, based on our individual perceptions. And even uh, spiritual truth has to be admitted through the door before it can become part of our consciousness. So if you ever had a discussion with somebody and you shared a truth principle and they looked at you like you were, they were real crazy, it is only because the gatekeeper didn't recognize that is information that that person normally lets in. And it's the same thing with us, okay? I read some things written by Paramahansa Yogananda or, or um, Thomas Troward or some of these other great writers, and it takes me a minute to let that information get in because the gatekeeper is saying, even though you've done a lot of studying and whatnot in metaphysics, this is a little bit beyond what you understand, and I don't know if I want to let that in yet. Uh, many, of you have, many of you talked about reading books where you had to read the same thing over and over again until finally your mind will let some of it in. So it is there that, you know, this at this point, that the ego will must be crossed out. In other words, you you, you, you got to furlough that gatekeeper, you know, so that this new information can start to come in. Um, and, you know, you want to give divine mind more free expression within yourself. So as this new information comes, maybe you get to, so, so if I'm making up, I'm just making up an imagery now, you get the gatekeeper to turn to divine mind and say, should I let this in? You know, because there are things out there that we don't want to let in. But that's what you want to do. Right now, the gatekeeper feels like it's the dominant force. But you got divine mind that can be the, an asset to letting us know what we should let in and what we should not let in. Okay. So, again, um, and that's, you know, that's a deep, deep metaphysical, metaphysical explanation of the Lenten journey. And it also is important for us to understand that uh, Moses learned it, it, in his journey, too, when he was going to he what happened, he had to open up the eye of his soul. So the eye of his soul had to be opened up because this whole thing of dealing with God, it wasn't that where he was before was not God's, but this was a whole different thing for him to understand this dynamic of God expressing itself through him. You know, the idea of going to the burning bush was a burning desire within himself to know more than what he knew, but then when he was exposed to it, he couldn't understand it. And that's why he said, who are you? You know, so that's sort of the process we're going through. So anyway, Moses had to have the eye of his soul open. And a lesson um, that was taught to him when in his encounter with God, a lesson that's important for us in this whole journey, is that he learned by yourself you are not enough. So by myself I am not enough to go through this transition from ego to spirit, from fear to faith. Okay, It went on to say, but if you turn to God and ask God for help, you will receive the guidance you will need to get through any challenge. The deal is we have to be able to trust God, trust the divine process working inside of us, um, and worship God only. You say, well, what else would I worship? We could get caught up in worshiping the condition that's in the world right now. That's not what we want to do. That's going to unfold as it unfolds. But we have to stay within in terms of working and trusting God in this process. So we want to trust the divine process working within us, worship God only, and continuously strive not to fall prey to fear, criticism, and doubt. All right? So these are the lessons that have followed will lead to spiritual enlightenment, which leads to Christ consciousness. So in our study over the years, it should be clear to us that we cannot remain as we are and at the same time try to evolve spiritually. You just can't do it. Okay? Our mission is to reposition our personal will in its relationship with our indwelling Christ, which again is what Jesus was referring to in John 3.13 when he said, the Son of Man must be lifted up to the Son of God. And I think I, I said um, brought that up last week. So the Son of Man is a stage of development in our consciousness where we're capable of discerning the difference between truth and error, love and fear, God and ego. But at this stage in consciousness, we are in a position um, to free ourselves from the fear-based thinking that creates disease in our, in our body. So as a son of man, 
uh, at that level of consciousness. There is an awakening that's happening, okay? However, at this stage in our spiritual development, even though we can discern the difference between truth and error, it doesn't mean that we'll always choose truth over error. And this is still a tenuous place for us because we still have a lot of personal will stuff going on that we have to un overcome. You know, the stuff in us is still saying, my will be done, okay? And so this idea of bringing the Christ is to help us to overcome that personal will stuff. Bringing the Christ is really asking for that help within, okay? And then being open when you receive those ideas that don't mesh with how you have been thinking. But to be fair, we have a lot of karmic energy to work through. And I'm not going to go into a whole thing of what is karma and so forth. Again, if you, if you join us on Monday night, we can talk more about that. But we have a lot of karmic energy to work through. But as we read in John 1, 17, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, meaning grace is, grace is sort of like an, uh, an antidote uh, to karma. Okay, So uh, Deepak gives us five different steps to cleanse ourselves of negative karma. And one of them is be grateful for every experience, good or not so good. Now, I know that needs more, more discussion. Again, Monday night, if you want to discuss what that means. Number two, act with love towards everyone, no matter what they have done. Now, remember, you're trying to cleanse yourself of karmic energy. Okay. Uh, number three, check your motives and make sure they come from a place of love for self and others. Number four, watch your attitude because negative thoughts create angry energy towards yourself. Okay? And five is um, be forgiving. Even though it can be the hardest thing to do, it can have the greatest impact on changing the karmic energy within yourself, changing it for the better. Okay? So Jesus understood the difficulty of the process of moving from my will to thy will, and I think the piece we're still missing is that we do not understand how much work and commitment is required for the process of spiritual transformation to take place. It's sort of, I think a lot of times it's a casual process for us. We say a few affirmations, we think about it from time to time, but it's, it's a process that really takes a tremendous amount of time. It's a day by day, moment by moment process, working to let go of the old self to make room for the new self. And this is one of the main reasons why it's important to come together so often like this with others, other people like yourselves. And if we can get the technology right, we're going to hopefully next uh, Sunday, Easter Sunday, be able to have more of a thing where we can actually see each other. But that's the, the reason why you want to spend more time around people who are also on that spiritual journey, just to remind you that there are other folks out there like you who are also trying to make that spiritual trans, trans, uh, transformation. So the reading from a past Science of Mind magazine, very past, four years ago, it says, the real self is God-given and cannot be denied. It is the place within each of us where God comes to a point of individualized and personified expression. Now, that's important because it's a place within each of us where God comes to a point of individualized and personalized expression, which means that God expresses in your life through you, and God expresses in your life through others. So that point where it says that uh, uh, where God comes to a point, that point is each one of you. It is me. It's Pamela. It's every one of us. That We are the point where God comes to for individualized and personalized expression. It is when we reach that point that we can truly proclaim, I and the Father are one. When you realize that you are an instrument through which God expresses that's when you become start realizing I and the Father are one. So now that we hopefully have a better understanding of this Lenten journey, let's end first with a powerful Bible verse for these times that we're facing together. And this is a power, it's from uh, Numbers 10, 9. When you go into battle in your own land, now, of course, going into battle in your own land is in your own mind. So when you go into battle in your own, in your own land, against an enemy who is oppressing you, and you can, you can understand what I'm saying based on what's happening today. So when you go into battle in your own land against an enemy who is oppressing you, sound a blast of the trumpets. Then you will, be, you will be remembered by the Lord your God and rescued from your enemy. 
I love that verse. Okay. And second, we're going to let's affirm, and I'm going to say it first, and then I'm actually going to have you say it with me. Even though we can't hear each other, we can hear ourselves. Let me say the whole thing first. I know that deep at the core of my being is a place where I am whole, complete, and perfect. I connect with it and experience the peace of God. So say this with me. I'm going to give you pieces of it at a time. I know that deep at the core of my being is the place where I am whole, complete, and perfect. I connect with it, with it. And, experience the peace of God. and experience the peace of God. And so it is. Amen. Right. So now we're going to have Pamela come up, and she's going to lead us through a special uh, Palm Sunday meditation. Good morning again. If you like, you may close your eyes, but find that place where you can become still and open to all the blessings of God. Imagine with me now palm branches at your feet and all around you. The palm symbolizes victory, triumph, gl gl gladness, and all that is brightest. The willow symbolizes sorrow, humiliation, captivity, and death. We call it the weeping willow. These two trees were brought together because they grow together in human life experience. No matter who and what we are, life is a mixture of all that these trees symbolize. So as your eyes remain closed, I ask that you put yourself in the peace of God. Keep your thoughts on the peace of God flowing over you in fathomless billows of love. Now as you walk the palms in your mind, know that this is the path of the one who showed us what we all might become. Imagine yourself as Jesus entering Jerusalem. Connect with the nonviolent Jesus. Allow yourself to be still and be aware of the choice you get to make in every moment of violence or nonviolence, chaos or peace. From the awareness of your nonviolent self and your peaceful self, feel the release, feel the compassion, the grace, the love, the purity, and transcend from the physical world to the spiritual world. And as we continue in our palm walk, remember the victory, the triumph, gladness, and all that is highest. Let us pray. Dear God, we too have made our journey into Jerusalem. We have walked the palm branches as a reminder of Jesus' journey into Jerusalem so many years ago. We give thanks for Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, and for his teachings that he has given us to live a life of abundance, peace, and joy. We give thanks and know that we too can overcome and live in the kingdom of God that lives and dies by love, service, and forgiveness. For all our blessings, we give thanks in the name and nature of our elder brother and way shower, Jesus the Christ. And so it is. Hosanna. Amen. Another technical difficulty here. The uh, music didn't play. We're not sure what that was about. Anyway, so um, thank you, hon, for that reading. Um, this is a time when we normally do our offering blessing, so we're going to ask everybody to hold, hold the offering in their hand. Um, or hold it in your mind, or whatever method you you know you like to give. And again, like I said, there's three different methods you can do: um, PayPal, uh, the Tithely app, T I T H E dot L Y. That's a, a, a way of texting, and also just mailing a check. We were asked yesterday at somebody in the office. The office is actually physically closed, um, according to the directive, 
um, but the mailbox is on the outside, and Patty and, uh, makes a trip there a couple of times a week to see that. So, you know, we're very thankful for the, uh, the continued support of Unity Center of Light. But holding that offering in your hand, let's do this affirmation together. We, we bless, bless and give, and give thanks, thanks for these tithes and offerings as, as they, they go, go forth to continue, continue the healing, loving work being done through the Unity Center of Light. Amen. All right. So just a few light notes to let you know what is coming up. Um, and remember, mo all the things I'm telling you are being done through Zoom, and uh, you can get the Zoom uh, information from the e-newsletter and the weekly um, re weekly news that Patty sends out. So April okay. sends update. Yeah, the, thank you, the weekly update. So Patty sends that out. April is the one who creates that e-newsletter. And all this information in terms of how to get onto the Zoom uh, um, accounts is on there. So uh, today, I think starting now, <laughs> is our youth and family team is offering a sacred circle experience for our younger youth at 12 today. Again, that's on Zoom. Uh, Unity Eastern Regional Team Consultant and Unity by the Shore of Neptune, New Jersey are offering an online Sacred Sunday experience for our teenagers, uh, and that's at 1230 today. And then starting Monday, April 6, join us for an afternoon prayer moment, keeping the high watch at 4 o'clock. And every weekday during April, take a 15-minute prayer pause Together we go within and reconnect with spirit and one another. So that's Monday, April 6th, tomorrow, is going to be, um, again, af uh, afternoon prayer moment, keeping high watch. Look again on your e-newsletter and your weekly update to find information on that. And then due to popular requests, uh, the Monday evening, April 6th, 7 p.m., Ask the Minister. We're going to have that. That's a Zoom class as well, again. We had one this past uh, Monday. It was great. That's where you can come and ask the questions just in terms of wanting to understand more about Bible and metaphysics or want to understand how to apply these to what is happening in our world today. And on Tuesday evening, 7 p.m., the Course of Miracles group is switching to a Zoom, a Zoom call, so please check, out, check that out. On this Wednesday, the Fasting and Feasting 2020 group concludes their study and discussion on the Lent booklet. Uh, the access information for all these connections, again, is on Zoom. Now, this coming, yeah. I, oh, it's also on the website, too. Thanks, Tom. You can also get it on the website. If you did not get an e-newsletter, you did not get a weekly update, you can go to our website and find all of this uh, information about how to connect on Zoom. And, then, and also, if you don't feel comfortable with Zoom, you might want to go out to Zoom.com. There's lots of tutorials out there. Because this is, how, this is the world right now. Uh, even at the college, uh, this is how we're teaching classes through Zoom. So uh, you wanna, if you don't feel comfortable with it, please go out on the website and just take one of their, take the beginning tutorial and it'll help you understand it. Now this coming Good Friday, April 20th, 10th. Uh, sorry, April 10th, we're planning a spiritual communion opportunity. So what we'd like to we're gonna try we're gonna we're gonna we're looking at doing a spiritual community through Zoom, all right. So you want to have your um, little little uh, glass of wine or apple juice or um, juice. We've got grape juice and a piece of bread just so you can take advantage virtually of this um, communion. Okay, so a spiritual communion on Friday, Good Friday, Good Friday, April the tenth. And we're going to send you more details about that through this week. Okay, On Sunday, April the 12th, we have a special Easter Sunday plan. We are looking to get all the bugs worked out before, but uh, according to how the technical parts of that work out, we'll let you know how that unfolds. But there will be a special service on Easter one way or the other. Okay, So stay tuned for more information about um, our special services and Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Yeah, have a wonderful day. God bless. God bless. Stay safe. Okay.